it's very easy to just go about your normal life when it's cold out, not thinking anything of it. You layer up, you, you know, whatever, you stay in the house, whatever, maybe you don't go outside as much. But there's a couple of things that happen even in a short period of time when we're out in the cold. And especially if we're exercising, these things become exceptionally, exceptionally important. Okay, Our bodies have a way of conserving fluid and conserving energy and heat. And when we're out in the cold, what ends up happening is our body ends up vasoconstricting in the extremities. So we have a less amount of blood flow traveling to the arms, to the legs, to the extremities in general, and most of it pools to the core. Now, this is obviously a survival thing to keep our organs warm. And because of that, almost every single sense within the body is saying, hey, there's enough fluid here. Everything is fine. So as a result, you're not in this situation where you are preserving fluids. So let me put it like this. Normally, you have enough fluid circulating throughout the body and you have signaling devices that are going to recognize that fluid is either low or high. If fluids were low, the body would instigate a thirst response and you would drink water. Also, if water was low or fluid was low, the body would do what it could to conserve water or retain fluid. This is actually a good thing in a time of necessity. But because most of the fluid is coming to the central system, the central area of the body, what's happening there is most of the signals are still regulating or recognizing rather that we have enough fluid even though we might be dehydrated because it's all concentrated in one particular area. So this ends up diminishing a thirst response by up to 40%. Okay, so we've seen in documented research that in the winter time, in colder weather, thirst alone can be diminished up to 40%. The biggest driver for a lot of us in terms of hydration or properly hydrating is how much water we are consuming. Okay, now in the summertime or when it's warm out, when it's hot out, we have a pretty normal thirst response. We can recognize, hey, yeah, it's time to drink water because it's hot out and we literally have a signal telling us we are thirsty. Imagine that signal being 40% less. Okay, now imagine not being able to consume as much simply because you don't feel like you need it. Now, to make a little bit of sense of this, there was a study that was published in the journal Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise. Now, I found this particularly interesting because they took a look at two particular phases. So phase one, they took a look at uh, two sets of groups. One group was exercising at 50% of their VO2 max for 60 minutes in either 80 degrees, okay? And another group was doing it at 29 degrees. Okay, so one in the cold, one in the relative heat. Okay, now for phase two, they had them do a similar thing, except they were really just standing there. They were standing in the cold temperature or standing in the warm temperature. Now, there were some pieces to this that aren't really super relevant to this video, but the bottom line was that they found across the board for both groups that were either you uh, hydrated, which means they were adequately hydrated or already dehydrated in the beginning, it didn't matter. There was a 40% reduction in their overall thirst. So thirst was diminished by 40% in the cold group, even if they were just standing there. So obviously exercise could exacerbate this over a period of time. So it's something we definitely need to be paying attention to. So what exactly is the mechanism here? I mean, we know that, yeah, maybe there is an actual signaling that is making us less thirsty, but is something actually happen? Are we actually getting more dehydrated when it's cold than we may realize? Now, there's something that is called cold-induced diuresis. Now, this isn't 100% proven, but this seems to be the most common theory as to why we might get more dehydrated when it's cold out. Okay, so scientists are still really trying to understand why this happens, but it comes back to how I kind of opened this video, how I discussed uh, the vasoconstriction that occurs. So if you were to go out and run in the cold right now, you would probably see that your veins in your arms or your veins in your legs or whatever are smaller or you're really non-existent. You're not seeing them, right? Okay, well, this is the vasoconstriction that is induced by the cold. So again, all the fluid is really rushing as much as it can to the core. Okay, well, what ends up happening there is you have an increase in blood pressure because of the fluid that is coming to your core. Okay, so because you have an increase in blood pressure in the core, that is signaling for the kidneys to expel fluid. 
and to trigger you to pee more because right now you're signaling that your blood pressure is higher at the core because all of your fluid from other areas of your body has concentrated to the core. So as a result, what happens? The kidneys say, uh oh, we need to lower blood pressure. What's the quickest way for the body to lower blood pressure? Reduce fluid. That way you're having less actual pressure pushing out. Okay, so then you urinate. So what happens? You become dehydrated. So then, well, at that rate, but also when you go back up to a normal temperature, then you would recognize that you're quite a bit dehydrated. Now, that's not the only piece, and that's a proposed mechanism, right? We know that this mechanism happens. We know that this process happens, but is it the main reason for overall dehydration when it's colder out? Now, another piece that we don't always think about is the amount of water vapor that leaves our body when we breathe, especially when it's cold. Now, you might be thinking, okay, when it's cold out, you're exhaling the same amount of water vapor. It's actually a little bit different, okay, because when it's cold outside, even if relative humidity is the same as when it's warm outside, there's going to be less water vapor. Now, compare that to the concentrated or saturated amount of vapor that is going to be in your lungs. Uh, when you exhale, what is going to happen is you're going to have an increase in vapor as a result of that. Basically, the lower the water vapor pressure in the ambient air, the more vapor you actually exhale. Okay, now there are some military studies that have kind of demonstrated that uh, we understand how much vapor is exhaled when we breathe, when we're under load, et cetera, et cetera. So from that, you can do a little bit of math and you can find that you're going to have about double the amount of water vapor exhaled if you were in an extremely cold situation. Now, in this case, we're talking like sub-zero, negative four. Okay, so that doesn't mean that you go out and run in negative four degrees, uh, but what it does mean is that the colder the temperature, the more water vapor we are exhaling, essentially, under metabolic load. So the more that we work out, as well as the colder it is, the more water vapor we actually lose. Now, one thing that we have to consider is that if you were working out in the sun or in the heat, yeah, you'd be sweating more. So would you lose more with your sweat? Yes, you probably would lose more with your sweat. But what I'm suggesting here is that when you are exhaling water vapor, you're not thinking about it. When you're sweating, you're usually pretty conscious about it. This is just another one of those pieces as to why it ends up being a little bit dangerous with how dehydrated you can get when it's cold out because you're just not paying attention to it. It's just easy to forget, in other words. Uh, it's really, I mean, one of the things that you can pay attention to, yes, obviously add more water. Add more water, of course. But I think people forget that mineralization is one of the bigger pieces too. Sodium is going to allow you to retain more water. So simply put, add electrolytes into the mix. That plays a very big role. Now I'm gonna continue with this video, but if you wanna try out my preferred electrolytes, I put a link down below. It's for a company called LMNT Element. That is for a free sample pack. Okay, so a sample pack of eight element electrolyte packets with 1,000 milligrams sodium. Okay, they have 200 milligrams potassium and 60 milligrams magnesium. Plus they have some really delicious flavors. My first uh, favorite flavor is the chili mango. Okay, that is so unbelievably good. And then second to that is the lemon lime, I think. And then lemon habanero is pretty darn good too. But anyhow, that is a link down below for you to try them out totally free. Just pay a couple of bucks shipping. So that's going to give you eight sample packs of elements. So I definitely recommend you do try them out. So again, that link is down below. It's drinklmnt.com slash Thomas. Another component that seems pretty obvious but is often overlooked uh, was one that was investigated quite a bit uh, by the U.S. Army. Okay, they took a look at cold weather clothing. Okay, and they found that when there was insulation with cold weather clothing, that you could be sweating up to two liters per hour under intense exercise in this cold weather clothing. Now, depending on how you are layered, that may actually breathe quite well and end up making it so you don't feel like you're drenched. So again, it's one of those things where when it's cold, even if you are sweating with cold weather clothing, you don't feel it the same way that you ordinarily would. So this becomes a really big problem. So we have to be paying very, very close attention to this overall. And then of course, we look at the catecholamine response. When it is really, really cold out, you have a heightened stress response, okay? Have you ever noticed that when you go outside in the cold, sometimes you start hyperventilating a little bit, you start breathing a little bit heavier, a little bit harder, a little bit faster. This is a pretty normal response 
response, okay? It's a stress response. And when you start exhaling more, not only are you releasing water vapor, but you're also releasing uh, CO2, these carbons. And when you're actually exhaling carbons, this is a good thing you're burning fat. So there's some inclination to say maybe you burn more fat when you are actually training in cold weather. That is great and really good news. But with that, you're also losing water. Now, I do want you to remember that there are some studies, I can't remember exactly what study it was, what research journal, but essentially when you are properly hydrated, you actually get an elevation of your core metabolism to begin with. So being in cold weather and optimizing for fat loss while also being hydrated could really optimize for fat loss a little bit more. Okay, so something to be paying attention to. Now, when I say catecholamines, adrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine, these things get elevated when it's cold out because, again, it's a shock. It's a stress response. That alone is elevating the metabolism. All very good things and what we are after, but they are things that factor in with hydration, and we have to keep this stuff in mind. One of the other things I want to throw out there as a little hack, in addition to utilizing electrolytes, you may want to consider playing around with glycerol. Glycerol is a non-toxic byproduct of uh, a lot of different foods, okay? Vegetable glycerin, glycerol, really nothing to really be worried about, but it is highly, highly uh, attracted to water. It's got a very high osmotic action. So what that means is that when you consume it, you draw a lot more water in. So it's one of those things where if you're going to be going into an extreme situation where you know it's really cold, it might not be a bad idea to front load, which means before going out into cold, with a couple of tablespoons of simple glycerol. Okay, this sounds crazy, but there's some studies to back this up as well. So there was a study that was published in the Journal of Applied Physiology. I found this super intriguing. Okay, they took a look at subjects and they gave them 1.75 liters of water. And then they found in a cold situation, uh, or just general situation actually, as far as hydration goes, three hours later, they only retained about 32% of the water that they consumed. So that means when you're drinking a lot of water, you're losing a lot of water too. Okay, so only about 32% was retained. When they consumed that same 1.75 liters of water along with 70 grams of glycerol, which is not much glycerol, they were able to retain 60%. So they almost doubled the amount of water that they were able to retain. Okay, this is pretty darn intriguing. And again, it's not something you always have to do, but if you're going maybe snowshoeing and you're gonna go out in the cold and you can't pack a lot of water and you want to hyperhydrate and hold on to it, that's a pretty awesome strategy to use there. Basically, glycerol is going to increase what's called osmosis osmotic pressure. So it's going to encourage the body to draw water into different places. What this means is that you're actually encouraging the water to move throughout the body, not just go in and absorb and do whatever. The glycerol is it's hydrophilic, so it's attracting water. So where the glycerol goes, the water is going, which means it can get into the cell, it can get into the tissue. It's just an interesting strategy, but I still think the most important piece is gonna be the mineralization piece, and also the most practical when it comes down to just everyday life. A couple of things you probably should look for just as signs of dehydration in the cold. Okay, the dry skin, the chapped lips, that is one of the first places you're gonna start noticing dehydration. Yes, the cool, dry air itself can play a role there, but you're gonna recognize dehydration in that piece as well. And another thing I wanna caution you with is that considering the cold weather uh, diuresis effect, you might not have a change in your overall urine color. Okay, so you might end up having perfectly clear urine and that's indicating that you're hydrated because what's happening is you're losing excess fluid that the body is registering as excess because it's only really releasing it from the core, not from the entirety of the body where it's gonna be concentrated urine. So a lot of times we'd say, oh, if your urine is really yellow, it means you're dehydrated. But in this case, you can even have clear urine. So I just don't want you to look at that. You should always just be more proactive. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.